Well, hello everybody. Um, it's uh, Saturday morning after a pretty crazy work week and uh, I got the bench cleared off. The SX1050 is all finished and put together. And before I start our next project, um, which I really need to get to, it's a, a viewer had sent me in a piece of equipment that we're going to do. I thought I would uh, clarify a little bit of what we talked about a while back or on the last video concerning FM stereo multiplex. Uh, a couple of my astute viewers there kind of pointed out some of the things that I said that could be a little bit confusing especially to those of you who are new to uh, this type of thing. So in an attempt to redeem myself I thought I would try to <laughs> make good on that a little bit and help you out uh, to clear up any of the confusion. And again, this can be very complicated, and no matter how you word things and how you explain it, it still can be hard to follow. But I'll try to make it as simple as I can and uh, make it as clear as I can. So let's start back at the basics with FM, with FM uh, mono, okay? I'm just getting my paper straightened out. So, I wrote some notes down before I started this video so that uh, I could kind of remind myself what I'm doing here so I'm not flying by the seat of my pants and going off the top of my head. Uh, when I'm doing these restorations and, and these alignments and things, I talk off the top of my head and sometimes that can be a little confusing to some of you all out there. So, I don't mean to do that and I apologize for anything that I do. Please call me out on it. and. Uh, Definitely, I'll be more than happy to make things right. Um, I want you to all to learn the right way and be able to enjoy this hobby if you decide to do this. Or if you're just uh, curious about it, I just want to make sure you know the truth. So let's start with FM. Just FM mono. Um, we're going to assume that a radio station is transmitting at 100 megahertz and I want to tune in that 100 megahertz station so what is my radio actually doing okay and we're gonna kind of follow along in the case of the SX1050 because that's fresh in our mind we just did this video and uh, that way you can kind of apply this concept to other tuners as well I mean everybody has their own little differences but you know it, FM is FM okay so first of all, we have the radio station will broadcast that that uh, carrier at 100 megahertz, which is your radio station, 100 FM. Uh, of course, in this case, it would be uh, 100.2, okay? Because it they go every 200 kilohertz. But we'll get in. We'll, you learned that already. But understand that. Let's say it is 100 megahertz that's the center frequency and the the actual modulation will be plus or minus 75 kilohertz okay um, if you add those together that's 150 kilohertz of bandwidth you know from one end to the other centered at that 100 megahertz and remember our stations are 200 kilohertz apart so we're using 150 kilohertz and we're still giving ourselves 25 kilohertz on either side to make sure we have clarity between our radio stations right so that's what that's all about now in the case of our SX1050 if you look down here and I'll try to focus you and this new camera has the fastest zoom on the planet um, so the signal is captured from the antenna right here where it says in and it goes through what we call a tank circuit which is basically a combination of T1 this little transformer and VC or variable capacitor one this TC one is that little trimmer cap that we were trimming on top of that little gold box okay all this does is kind of fine tunes how this thing works okay you can actually take that out of the circuit for what we're doing. We're just think we're just planning on a perfect world here. So basically, by adjusting this capacitor when you turn the tuning knob, you're changing the resonant frequency of this tank circuit. So it will only resonate when 
a signal comes in here that is the same frequency that this is tuned to. So in this case, when I tune this capacitor till it says 100 megahertz, then I will have a 100 megahertz uh, channel can get through here. When it comes through, it goes into this little dual channel MOSFET. Now this can be a transistor, this can be a MOSFET, this can be an integrated circuit, there's you know a tube, uh, different things that this can be. Okay, So it is amplified and we call this an RF amplifier. Now not every tuner has an RF amplifier. Some of the really low end, low, low cost pocket radios and things, they skip right through this and go just straight into your IF circuit. Um, so, and as you'll see in the next project, sometimes you have multiple stages of RF amplification. Uh, the really high-end receivers will have uh, multiple stages of RF amplification to make them more sensitive. Okay, the next thing is at the same time that we're tuning that signal up here, let me back up again, sorry, that we're tuning this signal up here, okay, we also have what we call another tank circuit that we call our local oscillator. And in, in this particular case, we're talking about this little circuit down here, okay, and here's this tank circuit. Now, mechanically, this VC4 capacitor, it's a variable capacitor, is connected to this one via a shaft. So they're all, they call this a tuning gang, okay? So when I turn this one, I turn this one. When I adjust this frequency, resonant frequency, I also adjust this resonant frequency. The difference is, this is being driven into oscillation by your radio station, okay? I hope I'm not saying that wrong technically, but I'm trying to keep it simple. This one is driven into oscillation by resonating with, you know, through this transistor circuit. So basically these transistors are being oscillated at a frequency chosen by this, and that creates basically a sine wave, okay? Now, there's some significance to that because what we're doing is this is adjusted so that whatever this resonant frequency is tuned to, this one is tuned 10.7 megahertz higher. So, in other words, if I tune this guy right here to, to 100 megahertz, this guy at the same time will be tuned to 110.7 megahertz, which is the 100 plus the 100 or plus the 10.7 okay we then have a transistor or MOSFET or tube or whatever you want to call it that in this in this case it's a dual gate MOSFET again that takes these two signals and combines them together into one complex signal we call that mixing okay so now you have two frequencies together coming out of here and going into this little tank circuit here. Now, you have several things here. You have this frequency going here, you have this frequency coming out here, and then you also have the sum of these frequencies coming out here and the difference of these frequencies coming out here. What this thing does is its job is to filter out the difference between the two. So it will take the local oscillator and, sub and subtract the received signal from it. So you have this minus this equals this, the output right here, which should always be 10.7 megahertz. Remember, these are always 10.7 apart, so the difference should always be 10.7. We call that the intermediate frequency. Now, that goes into a series, in this case, in this radio, of ceramic filters. Those are those little brown three-legged, uh, let me see if I've got one here, hold on. Okay, so here's, here's one type, and you can see they're just a little tiny, let's see them. 
just a little three pin filter, they're a ceramic filter. These ones have a bandwidth of 180 kilohertz. What that means is this, this thing will filter, okay, anything centered on 10.7 kilohertz or 10.7 megahertz, okay, anything that is 90 kilohertz above and 90 kilohertz below, okay. This is considered a wideband uh, filter for 10.7 megahertz IF, okay. The smaller this bandwidth, the more selective the tuner will get. So, in other words, it'll be able to reject splatter and noise on either side of that channel. However, it also will limit the amount of bandwidth of information that it can carry through. So, what that means is technically you could, number one, it makes the tuner harder to tune in when you have a narrower bandwidth because they make 120 kilohertz, 150 kilohertz, even 100 kilohertz. But what happens is as you squeeze that down, uh, you start clipping off part of your stereo, especially when it's stereo multiplex, especially when you have SCA and things we're not talking about right now. So these, the, the whole purpose of them is to narrow that signal down, that 10.7 megahertz down, so that the only parts that get through is that multiplexed signal, you know, your, your tuner signal, okay, or your audio, okay. So the 10.7 is filtered multiple times and amplified with a little preamp. And when it comes out, it is an intermediate frequency centered at 10.7 megahertz with your original audio signal on it, okay, riding on that 10.7 megahertz carrier. Now, after that happens, okay, uh, by the way, this the SX1050 uses 150 kilohertz uh, filtering. They they like plus and minus 75, okay, instead of 180, okay. Um, the signal is filtered by the, these filters, and then it goes to your FM detection circuit. Now, in this particular case it goes into this everything chip. We call this the, the, the uh, IF function, FMIF function chip, but really this is an everything chip. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on inside here. And let me just move you up to my monitor here for a minute. Let's see if I can get the whole thing in. Okay, that's gonna be kinda flickery, huh? Yeah, we could see that. So, essentially, what we're what we're looking at let me see if I can alright so again so far over here on this side we're looking at the things that we've just discussed so you have your ceramic filters and you come out and it goes into pin 1 of that HA1137 uh, FMIF uh, integrated circuit and you can see the first thing they do is they go through three stages of amplification. So that boosts that signal. Even if we have a weak signal, it boosts it to make the, uh, the receiver more sensitive. Okay, so the ability to, to pull it to uh, amplify weak signals is called sensitivity. And the ability to discern one close channel to another is called selectivity. So you have sensitivity and selectivity, okay? This will increase your sensitivity, and these help increase your selectivity, okay? And by playing with these, we can kind of find a happy medium where everything, where the amp, or where the receiver isn't too noisy, but it's still sensitive, and so forth, okay? From there, we go into what's called a quadrature detector. So right here is where the magic happens. This is where it's going to strip that 10.7 megahertz off and come out with your actual audio, okay? And by the time it gets through all this, at pin 6, you actually have an audio, uh, your audio output. 
So really this one little chip takes care of a whole bunch of things that a whole bunch of circuitry would have had to have taken care of before. So one little 16 pin chip does all that. Now, here's one thing you might that might help you on these. If I short out this antenna lead so there's nothing there, the only thing I should have is my carrier frequency that this is tuned to and my local oscillator, okay? And when they, when they subtract from one another, the only thing I should have here is 10.7 megahertz with nothing on it, okay? And if that is perfectly centered, in other words, if that 10.7 megahertz is perfectly centered um, at this pin, the output of this should be zero volts DC. If my if something is goes wrong in that in that front end so like let's say we have our local oscillators a little bit trimmed out of place or this one your tuner is trimmed a little bit out of place with these TC's or trimming capacitors or something is wrong in here it's gonna throw that 10.7 off center and you're going to get an error voltage here of DC it's gonna be very tiny but at pin 6, you will see that. And what that's going to do is that's going to change the swing of your, uh, of your audio. And at one end of, you know, when it swings positive or negative, whichever end is off-centered to, it's going to cause clipping and cause distortion. So an easy way to adjust that is to short out the antenna lead. Just, you know, clip the antenna input and ground together with a jumper clip. Check this and you can actually adjust these uh, your actual coil until you have zero volts at pin six okay that's just a little side note um, the idea is by the time it comes out of this chip with no modulation at all and no uh, outside world getting into it causing any kind of noise any background noise at all the teeniest little bit will throw this off we'll put a little signal on here well with complete nothingness at 10.7 megahertz centered you shouldn't have anything out of there okay so at this point in time we have everything that we need coming out of there and if this was just a normal FM radio uh, we could come right out here and we could pretty much go into our amplifier okay or into our preamp um, you have a sim simple FM radio okay now there's a lot of other things that I didn't talk in talk about with like limiter circuits and so forth like that but we're really not going in that much depth here on this but just gives you an idea of how this thing works and what I was doing okay let's come back down here so that's FM and now let's say that we have an FM stereo well what's coming out of that pin 6 uh, of this which is pin 6 is going to be your uh, you're going to actually have hold on a second let me get the range here you're actually going to have your full signal and you're going to be using up a lot more of this plus and minus 75 kilohertz in a mono transmission you're only going to use 15 kilohertz of bandwidth because your audio goes from 0 to 15 kilohertz so the highest frequency you can hear on an FM broadcast in a, t in the, in a typical situation is 15 kilohertz um, but if you have stereo there's going to be a bigger signal there it's going to have wider bandwidth because it has to carry more information than just that mono audio signal so that's what we're going to look at next okay so we talked about mono now we're going to talk about stereo okay and again let's start at what is going on at a stereo radio station that's transmitting stereo okay so at the radio station all right let's let's talk about that first you have your turntable you have your CD you have your digital audio player whatever you have at the station 
and of course it generates a you know a stereo audio signal which stereo audio consists of a left channel and a right channel so you have two channels worth of information or of sound your left and right audio goes into a circuit and it gets just combined they just add left plus right together so it's kind of like when you take your uh, the stereo output of your mp3 player and you run it through a little Y you know a couple 1k resistors or 100 ohm resistors or whatever and you tie it together and that output would be a mono signal just very simple right and that mono signal would have all the information of left and right all in one place so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to combine the left and the right and we're going to create a mono signal and it's going to be filtered at 15 kilohertz meaning I don't care how high fidelity that that uh, record or that CD or whatever is it can it can go clear up to 20 kilohertz or higher you're not going to hear it you're only going to hear frequencies up to 15 kilohertz now some classical uh, stations can actually push the boundaries of the limits a little bit and go a little bit higher than this but in in the in the regular normal world this is kind of the accepted standard 15 kilohertz okay and we're gonna call this signal L plus R because it's your left plus right it's your mono signal now another part of the circuit in the transmitter is going to take the left and the right channels and subtract them from one another okay and we're going to call that signal L minus R okay so that's going to be kind of a strange sounding thing <laughs> if both of them are transmitting the same signal exactly you're not going to hear anything coming out of here and the difference between those two left and right channels will combine into one complex waveform that's not going to sound real good and it'll go into one mono signal again it's technically a mono signal but it's a mono signal derived by subtracting left uh, right from the left okay so it's L minus R so you have L plus R L minus R you have two audio signals now now having nothing to do with these guys we have a little signal generator inside that transmitter uh, or modulation circuit whatever you want to call it at, at the radio station and it takes it creates a steady sine wave of 19 kilohertz now why 19 well number one it's higher than this um, so this this frequency this tone is not going to interfere with your audio which is why we're clipping this off here now why didn't we go higher on all this well <laughs> back in the day they invented this I don't think they uh, really cared about that um, this is an older technology you know so anyways you have a steady sine wave of 19 kilohertz all right and that 19 kilohertz we call the pilot tone okay and really it's there it's just sitting there riding on your FM radio station carrier just making this constant drone of 19 kilohertz now we call this the pilot tone and this pilot tone if a radio if a stereo radio sees this there's a special circuit we're gonna learn on the next page here if it sees it you're going to know that there is a stereo broadcast wrapped up inside this radio station okay um, without this 19 kilohertz and I think we demonstrated this on the last video for the 1050 all I did was I took a 19 kilohertz tone and I modulated it onto my FM uh, signal generator and lo and behold the FM stereo light popped right on and th there was no stereo station was there but we fooled it because all that all that thing needs is 19 kilohertz to be tricked into saying oh it must be stereo okay now so that's this that's we call that the pilot tone because that pilot is what drives the uh, the tuner 
into stereo mode or mono mode. When it's not there, it's mono. When it is there, it, we know it's stereo. Now, another thing we do is we generate a 38 kilohertz sine wave, okay? And we do that by doubling that 19 kilohertz pilot, okay? So it's going to be phase locked to this 19 kilohertz, okay? So you take that 38 kilohertz and it's added in phase with the 19 kilohertz pilot creating a 38 kilohertz modulated subcarrier okay very important it's modulated and we're gonna find out why in a minute but you have this 38 kilohertz signal starting at 19 kilohertz and, and going up from there so we're modulating the 19 kilohertz at 38 kinda sorta alright we'll see this in a minute I, I might have worded that a little bit wrong, forgive me. <laughs> it all makes sense here in a minute. I have a picture. The 38 kilohertz is then canceled out, and this is done by having equal and opposite sidebands of the 15 kilohertz centered at the 38 kilohertz. And the sidebands cancel each other out and create what we call a double sideband suppressed carrier signal. So if you ran that signal, through a normal AM detection circuit, you'd get nothing out. Even though there's audio in there, because the sidebands are equal and opposite, they cancel each other out. Now, you ham radio guys that are out there um, probably understand a lot about sideband because that's kind of like a, a popular form of communications these days is say, upper sideband and lower sideband. But as you can tell, if the if both sidebands are running at the same time, uh, you know, and one of them is not suppressed off, they cancel each other out, and you don't get any. You get it. You get no sound. So we call that double sideband suppressed carrier. Okay, so there is no 38 kilohertz signal when the two sidebands are added together in that circuit okay I don't know if I explain that right again I keep saying that but I'm trying my best um now the whole mass <laughs> so you got your first 15 kilohertz which is your L plus R you have your 19 kilohertz pilot tone you have your 38 kilohertz uh, phase lock to the 19 kilohertz and you have your L minus R being modulated onto that 38 kilohertz, okay? And that whole thing is added together into a big wide 53 kilohertz wide uh, signal. And that signal, that signal is called a multiplex signal and it is what we modulate our original FM radio station with, okay? So that, in this case, the 100 megahertz radio station at 100 FM is going to be going to have a 53 kilohertz wide signal carrying on it okay does that make sense now again I'm not talking about that there it can go beyond 53 kilohertz because they now have a thing called RDS which is basically if you ever have the car radio and you tune it into a radio station and the, and on the dot on the display of your digital car stereo it tells you the actual call letters of the radio station you know WKKK or whatever you know KST or whatever you want to call it WMBS whatever that is actually riding even above the 53 kilohertz so they're doing the same thing they're just adding another layer to it and SCA is subcarrier and you can even put another channel above all of that mess because it will fit in that 150 kilohertz bandwidth that we have, you know, so they're just utilizing more. So you're basically with SCA, you have two, uh, what are they call secondary carrier or something. I forget what SCA stands for. You have to forgive me. I have to look it up. Basically, it's just a hidden radio, <laughs> a hidden broadcast on that same channel. Okay. Um, you don't see that very much anymore. There's a few of them around, but not very popular anymore. So that's why I'm not talking about it. But this RDS is a very narrow little signal, and it just it's kind of a digital signal that it 
can strobe the information to your radio that can decode that and put out small text. So like when they're broadcasting a song, they can actually broadcast the name of the song. You know, and if you have a radio that can decode this, it'll display it on the, the digital display of the radio. Okay, so that's what this is. But we're not interested in any of this stuff. We're only interested in original stereo multiplex, which is your 53 kilohertz signal. Okay, now. Okay. Let's take a look at something here for a minute. And here is kind of a pictorial diagram of what we were just discussing. So, if you notice from zero, this is just a kind of a chart showing how your uh, multiplex signal works. If you look here, and they're showing the line actually starting up a little bit, this technically filters down to about 50 hertz. Um, Again, you can filter this lower if you have a higher end tuner and if you have a higher end radio station and you can get lower frequencies, but most of them roll off at about 50 hertz. So from 50 hertz to 15 kilohertz, uh, this is where your radio is filtering out and this is where we transmit our mono left or L plus R left plus right audio. And you notice it is very tall. Okay, it's a nice strong signal, right? We then go up this, remember we have a 53 kilohertz bandwidth here, see that? At 19 kilohertz, we have that audio 19 kilohertz tone sitting right here, and that's your stereo pilot. And then we're doubling that to 38 kilohertz, and then we're modulating the 38 kilohertz plus and minus you guessed it, 15 kilohertz. So we have 15 kilohertz of audio in both directions, positive, negative and positive going, and we call that our left minus right. And what we're doing is we're taking that signal that we, when we took the left minus the right, whatever audio comes out of that left minus right, you know, from, my, from our last page here, is getting modulated here. And as you can see, because this is being modulated up here and because it's double sideband suppressed carrier it it does attenuate the signal so we're actually getting that's why stereo signals tend to be noisier than mono because this has you have to have a stronger signal for this to be nice and clear than you do for this that's why if you switch your stereo to mono mode on a weak channel it sounds clearer okay less static so sitting right here is your plus and minus 15 kilohertz centered at 38 kilohertz above your modulation point there. And that's your suppressed carrier audio. And this, this is the information we're going to use to generate our left and right stereo channels. Okay, we need all of this. We need this, we need this, we need this, and we need this. All they all have to work together in some way to be able to create a left and right channel. So again, this is where I think I confused people. This is not your left audio and this is not your right audio, okay? This is just a double sideband modulated signal that consists of whatever happens when you subtract the right channel from the left channel. So any difference between right and left is the only thing that's going to be modulated at 38 kilohertz and it's modulated positive and negative so they cancel out this center frequency here so there is no 38 kilohertz carrier or pilot tone there's just this signal here which is equal and opposite so you don't unless you do something with it <laughs> there's you don't see it there it's like it's not even there okay Hope, hope I straighten that out. I don't know. We'll see. So, again, if the tuner is mono, it will filter out all the modulated frequencies above 15 kilohertz. So, anything above here, our normal FM mono radio just ignores it. There's filters in there, like those ceramic filters. They filter this out. In other words, you're 
your tuning coils, your tank circuits, they're centered on this. Anything higher than it, it doesn't even know it's there. It just treats it like another channel. It doesn't, it just tunes it out. Okay? However, if you have a stereo tuner, okay, there is a pilot circuit in that stereo tuner, and it will lock on to this 19 kilohertz pilot. When it sees this information there, okay, it says, hey, this is not a mono station, it is a stereo station, and it's going to reroute all this, okay, down into this whole circuit down here. And this is going to be where your FM demodulation takes place. That's in, in this case, on your SX1050, it's an HA1196 uh, FM phase lock loop demodulation chip. Again, it works just like this 1137. It tells a whole bunch of things all in one, okay? And then when it comes out of there, okay, we're going to talk about what all goes on in here in a minute. It comes out of here, it goes through a low pass filter that filters out everything but your audio, and you have left and right out. All right? And you can see, we come back here. So the pilot circuit locks onto the 19 kilohertz. This will switch in the stereo decoder, which is that stuff we just pointed out, and it'll reroute the signal down into it. The decoder will take that 19 kilohertz pilot, and it'll run it through a little circuit called a frequency doubler. And all it really does is it takes the 19 kilohertz and doubles it into a 38 kilohertz signal. And it is phase locked to this 19 kilohertz pilot. Now, if these guys get out of sync with one another, it everything it upsets the apple cart. Everything comes apart. So very, very imperative that the phasing of these stays tightly locked together. Now, you know, with modern phase lock loop, it's not a big deal, but you know, on, you know, in old radios, you know, and you're where you're t tuning capacitors and coils and things, these can get out of sync and it, it adversely affects a whole bunch of things. It can cause distortion, it can cause lack of sensitivity, uh, all kind of stuff. Um, when you have this PLL circuitry, that kind of uh, reduces or almost eliminates that. Now, the decoder also, okay, that chip, it's also filtering a part of it, okay, will filter everything below 23 kilohertz. Where does that number come from? That's the 38 minus 15 kilohertz. And it'll filter out everything above 53 kilohertz, which is the 38 plus 15 kilohertz. So it just leaves our left minus right modulation. Okay, so your left minus right audio signal is all that it sees. So that, that's another signal, and we're calling that the L minus R. Okay, and it's still double sideband suppressed carrier. It's you're seeing this. Okay, now if we take we now have an L plus R and an L minus R signal again. Okay, so basically. We have this signal right here, which is our mono signal, and then we have this signal here, which is the difference, okay, between left and right, okay? And when we take those two signals, and through the magic of electronics, for the left channel, if we take the left plus right, the mono signal, and the left minus right, and we add them together, Okay, add, and then divide that by two to strip away the, the one sideband, you get your left channel again. And it's all the way back full circle to a left channel audio. On the other hand, if we take the left plus R and subtract it from the left minus R and divide by two, we get the right signal again. Pretty ingenious how they did it. All right. Now, all that tuning and stuff that we were doing at the end of the stereo multiplex circuit is ensuring that 
these two signals are pure and that we are properly adding and subtracting them and properly dividing them exactly by two because when we change any of this even slightly off frequency it major a small change in any of these will cause a big change in the output your left and right and so that's why you know this is a critical adjustment you want to make sure that it's everything is aligned properly okay no matter what kind of tuner it is now I just kind of explained older technology okay this stereo that we looked at that SX 1050 was you know 1976 so it's you know you're pushing 40 year 40 year old technology uh, modern tuners are a lot different uh, with phase lock loop um, they use uh, solid state uh, capacitors called Vericap diodes and uh, they can get very accurate frequency control with those so there's a lot of updated technology that that they have and you'll find that a lot of this stuff is just you know kind of black box it's you know it, it's a chip and it works or it doesn't there's not as many fine-tuning adjustments to do anymore as there used to be um, so these older ones can be very complicated getting all this to line up and the older the, the FM stereo tuner the more mess there is to align and the harder it is to align and you have to make sure everything's at the right temperature and make sure that you know all kinds of things the more solid state everything became in time the more reliable it became and the less we really had to deal you know with things drifting off alignment and so forth so I hope this little video helped uh, clear the air. I'm sure there's still a couple things I may have misexplained or didn't get it perfectly, absolutely right, but hopefully that'll help you guys understand what's going on inside of a tuner. Now, the next video you're going to see is a <laughs> completely different animal. Uh, it's a tuner an FM, AM FM stereo tuner. Uh, it's also a Pioneer that somebody has sent me to uh, go over. I probably won't do the whole alignment because it's very complex um, and I'm gonna have to really focus on getting it done right. But uh, it's a lot more complicated than what we're looking at now because it has multiple stages of RF amplifiers. It has multiple IF stages. Uh, it has narrow and wide band filters, so there's actually two different paths that that signal can go through and be nar more narrow filtered uh, for selectivity uh, um, and more wide filtered for better audio bandwidth and, and so forth uh, and sensitivity. Uh, every one of those things has to be individually adjusted and aligned. Uh, it has a touch sensitive knob when you touch the tuner knob that it'll unlock the automatic lock circuit and, and then when you let go of the knob if you're close to frequency it'll kind of lock onto it. Very very complicated. So uh, we'll show a little bit of the check out of that and a little demo. Um, but uh, for this video, I really hope this helps you guys out. I know it's kind of long-winded, uh, but I really wanted to make sure I got this right and didn't mislead anybody from the last video. Uh, if you like it, give me a thumbs up. Uh, and uh, even if you find some things, just you know, let me know. You know, I'm, I'm not proud, like I said. We're all learning together. Uh, you never stop learning. Uh, every, anybody that says they know it all shows that they really know very little because there's always something new to learn. All right, that's it. You guys have a wonderful day and uh, more to come.